This is Residence 104.4 FM. Flipping marvellous. How are you? Yes, it is I, Nicholas of Hennigan, coming at you once more on Literary London. Uh, also, of course, we're available now in vision occasionally on bohemianbritain.com. But um, how are you? You good? Yeah, good. Well, I thought what we'd do this time is look at um, our focus. Occasionally, we focus on writers in London. Uh, I, of course, you may or may not know, wrote a thing called the London Literary Pub Crawl, which goes out every, uh, at least every week, sometimes more often than that, around Soho and Fitrovia, two areas um, either side of Oxford Street in the centre of London, if you're from outside London. Uh, if you are inside London, come and see us. Yes, <laughs> without turning me into a commercial. But it means I've spent quite a lot of time, and I think it's because I'm from Birmingham, actually. It's from, oh, excuse my thing pinging away. Um, it's because I'm out being outside London. Sometimes allows you to see things with uh, a new, fresh eye, a sort of a tourist's eye. Um, and I've always been quite impressed with London for obvious reasons. It's a, um, you know, an international city, arguably its centre of the theatrical world. Sorry, New York. Hmm. Sorry, Paris. Yeah, but London is. Um, so I thought we might, just for a bit of fun, have a look at uh, one or two um, areas of Soho in W1. So Soho's boundaries generally, if you know the area, are sort of Oxford Street to the north, Charing Cross Road to the east and Regent Street to the west. Uh, the southern edge of Soho isn't so clear and it lies sort of roughly on a line from Piccadilly Circus through Chinatown to Cambridge Circus. Um, but uh, don't worry too much about that. Um, I quite like this quote, if I can read it here, from H.G. Wells. What was his name? Todd... Uh, hang on, let me put these on. Yeah, I should have prepared, shouldn't I? Yes, um, Tono Bungay, H.G. Wells, wrote, quote, his character, and soon... I became quite familiar with the devious, vicious, dirtily pleasant exoticism of Soho. It was, uh, that was written in 1909. So Soho traditionally is a fairly lively place um, and it has attracted generations of writers over the centuries, including uh, William Blake, of course, who was born and lived locally in Soho. Shelley, who came to Soho after being sent down from Oxford. Arthur Rimbaud and uh, Paul Verlaine, who came to Soho in the 1870s after the Paris Commune fell. Evelyn War. Uh, the, the Irish writer Brendan Behan, who I love, and of course the Welsh wizard Dylan Thomas also were attracted to Soho's numerous pubs and bars after the Second World War. Uh, more recently, Ian McEwan, who uh, I had an experience with in Edinburgh, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> it was a very pleasant one, I have to say, at the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, Martin Amis and Will Self congregating around the pubs and clubs of Dean Street. And Greek Street uh, is actually where we go on the London Literary Pub Crawl. And in fact, we finish the London Literary Pub Crawl in Soho. But the name Soho, we think anyway, dates back to a 14th century hunting cry. Soho! Mm? Well, something like that anyway. Uh, when the area was a royal park. Now, in the 17th century, property developer Richard Frith, of course you'll know there's a Frith Street in Soho, Richard Frith began building on the parkland uh, because it was, yes, hunting grounds. Um, and Henry Compton, the Bishop of London, commissioned St Anne's Church where, by the way, William Hazlitt and Dorothy L. Sawyers are buried. Yes. So uh, that turned Soho into a sort of a rich man's playground, really. But then at the end of the 18th century, something called Mayfair happened. And the wealthy headed west to Mayfair. Soho began attracting waves of immigrants, particularly the French Huguenots, uh, the Jewish people and Germans. In the 19th and early 20th century, it was a place best avoided. Mm, yeah, certainly John Goldsworth, uh, Goldsworthy thought so in his cutting description of Soho in the Foresight Saga. Uh, and authors often chose the place when depicting sordid activities, as did Robert Louis Stevenson in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, of course, which he wrote in uh, 1886, and Joseph Conrad in The Secret Agent, which he wrote in 1907. During the 1920s and 30s, there were around 150 nightclubs opened in the area, most of which were apparently visited at some time or another by Noel Coward, but Soho largely escaped the Second World War bombing of the 1940s. 
In the 1950s, there was a sort of a new feeling of egalitarianism, really, I suppose, coupled with the area's tradition for tolerance. And that gave rise to a real bohemian scene which thrived around its jazz clubs, espresso bars and drinking dens. Um, I quite like the fact that a lot of the jazz clubs started because although bomb damage was was fairly scarce in Soho, it was still there. And of course, you could take over an abandoned cellar and there might not be any water, but there'd be no rent either. Hmm. So a few kicked off there. Uh, Colin uh, McInnes captured this era with its sort of casual sex violence and tensions in his London trilogy, City of Spades, Absolute Beginners, of course, and Mr. Love and Justice, uh, written between 1957 and 1960. But there was a downside among writers. Sohoitis, oh yes, saw the likes of Dylan Thomas and hard-drinking associates such as uh, Rainer Heppenstall and Julia McLaren Ross traipsed from one bar to another, soaking in the atmosphere but producing little work. And this probably explains why Julian McLaren Ross's Memoirs of the 40s was unfinished when he died in 1964. Have a look at Julian McLaren Ross, though. He wrote, uh, it's considered his masterpiece, called Of Love and Hunger. Uh, and it's well worth a read. Yeah, it's a good one. Julian McLaren Ross. In the 1960s, Soho vied with Chelsea, really, as the centre of the so-called swinging London, uh, a period better reflected in rock music than in literature, really. Uh, Anthony Fruin's what was it, London Blues, set on the sort of louche Soho world of the era, was published in 1997. Uh, arguably, in the 1970s, Soho lost its way a little bit, becoming best known for its porn clubs. And, of course, the rents dropped quite radically. Ironically, this led to the area's renaissance as publishers and advertising agencies and restaurateurs began moving in to take advantage of the uh, the lower property prices. There were gay clubs and venues, um, and they've now replaced most of the, the porn places. Um, and in the 80s and 90s, scores of designer bars opened to take advantage of the new relaxed licensing laws. Remember the... Uh, was it 24-hour drinking, which never actually came in? All that happened was that they repealed a law that was uh, established in the First World War to try and keep munitions workers out of the pub. So they'd get up early and not, you know, not have days off. Um, <clears throat> it was a big thing in the First World War. The king himself uh, became uh, teetotal and recommended everybody else to do so. And that hung around till the 1990s, that kind of philosophy and, and licensing laws. But uh, but it helped turn Soho into London's most fashionable quarter, really. And now there are thousands of tourists and day trippers and I suppose ordinary Londoners as well, drawn to the cafe bars and the clubs and the pubs. Um, its reputation, I think, as a literary haven probably continues uh, centred around writers such as Christopher Pettit, who's Robinson in 1993, is set in the area, as well as the new generation of would-be Julia McLaren Rosses getting up in just in time to catch the lunchtime crowd at the Groucho and Blacks before working the old Compton Street circuit of venues. So that's a kind of a little bit of a, well, you know, a kind of little bit of padded Soho. Um, I suppose, let's just take a look at one or two of the pubs, because you've got, well, they've got what they call West Soho, which is away from the main roads, such as Regent Street and Oxford Street. Um, it's got a fairly easygoing feel, West Soho, typified rather sort of by um, Attractive Street, which is Big Street, which is home of the Literary Review magazine, and Broadwick Street, which is where William Blake was born. And I very fortunately won uh, a bursary from the Society of London Theatre's Stage One charity, uh, and we had a, a, a room just off Carnaby Street uh, on Fubert's Place, and we had an office there, desk space, which sadly has gone. I'm sure my phone keeps pinging. I thought I'd switch this on. Uh, sadly, it's gone now, but it's a nice kind of area. Um, and yes, William Blake, uh, who you know write, wrote amongst other things, you know, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of the Night, was born on um, Broadwick Street. Now, I was looking for some sort of research, sort of some sort of plaque or blue plaque, or something, and there is a plaque there, but they've named a council flat after him. <laughs> There's actually a block of flats there, and they're named William Blake House, which I suppose is, you know, all right, really. Um, Landmarks to the north, really, can reach from Oxford Circus Tube, if you fancy having an explore, or further south from Piccadilly Circus Tube. Uh, bookshops, I think there's quite a few bookshops still. Of course, the old bookshops on the Charing Cross Road are still around there. Um, the main street, I suppose, is Oxford Street, which was a sort of a downhill road, um, which became London's High Street, has become London's High Street. It was named, Oxford Street was named after Queen, Queen Anne's statesman, Robert Harley, 
was a Harley Street as well, of course. Uh, he was the first Earl of Oxford who also gave his name to Harley Street. One day in 1932, Edith Sitwell bumped into T.S. Eliot's first wife, Vivian, in Oxford Street and greeted her by name. Mrs. Eliot replied, You don't know me. You've mistaken me for that terrible woman who is so like me. <laughs> Oxford Street had numerous literary mentions. The diarist Henley Crabb Robinson wrote on the 24th of July, 1811, how he went to a party at Charles Lamb's where Blake showed Southerly, uh, Southerly a perfectly mad poem called Jerusalem. Oxford Street is in Jerusalem. Of course, that was put to music in the uh, 1900s, early 1900s, of course. Jerusalem, uh, arguably. Some people say it should be the British national anthem, or certainly the English national anthem. I'm not sure I agree with that, but still. In uh, Confessions of an Opium, uh, sorry, Confessions of an English Opium Eater in 1821, Thomas de Quincey recalled spending an evening walking up and down Oxford Street with a prostitute, Anne, when he first came to London, when he was penniless. Charles Dickens complained in Sketches by Boz in 1837 that he could discern no speck in the road to encourage the belief that there is a cab or coach to be had. Nowadays, Oxford Street is probably the best place in the capital for finding a cab. And in Nicholas Nickleby in 1839, Charles Cheeryby drag, Cheeryble, sorry, drags Nicholas back into Oxford Street and bundles him into an omnibus on its way to the city. Uh, Thomas Hardy even wrote a poem about it. In 1872, he wrote, Coming up Oxford Street's evening. And he makes uh, some attempt to romanticise what has traditionally been a fairly dingy street. In Graham Greene's The End of the Affair in 1951, uh, Bendrix has a dream in which he describes an Oxford Street where all the shops were full of cheap jewellery, which probably is still a bit true today. Uh, Virginia Woolf once wrote how the pavements seemed to sprout horrid tragedies. And nowadays, this usually involves sort of gullible tourists hanging over a tenner for perfume, which consists mainly of water, I think. Um, something which Keith Tallent does in Martin Amos's London Fields, which he wrote in 18, uh, 1989. And uh, for Peter Aykroyd's Oscar Wilde from the 1983 novel The Last Testament of Oscar Wilde, the turning is all street and no Oxford. So there's a few things along there that's kind of worth looking at. Um, Marshall Street, as I mentioned, was William Blake's birthplace and address. Um, site of Blake's birthplace is now, yeah, one of one of his um, sort of uh, tower blocks. Um, and I thought we might just look, if you're going to be in Soho, swing around the corner, why don't you, eh? Yeah, go on then. Swing around the corner to Dean Street. Uh, Dean Street's one of my favourite streets in London as well, I have to say, partly because of the Soho Theatre. But if you're walking down sort of north to south on Dean Street, look up, look up, young men and women, look up at number 28 Dean Street and you'll see a blue plaque up there because Karl Marx wrote most of Das Kapital while living in what he described as an old hovel, two evil, frightful rooms at the top of the block, number 28 Dean Street. Um, it was during the 1850s, there was no toilet, there was no running water, the rent was £22 a year, and a Prussian friend who came to visit Karl Marx described how everything is dirty and covered with dust, so that to sit down becomes a thoroughly dangerous business. <laughs> Karl Marx, who lived off the postal orders and crates of wine that Frederick Engels used to send him, and who made some extra money by freelancing for the New York Tribune, spent most of the day researching what became Des, uh, Das Kapital in the British Museum, which isn't too far away. The, 19, sorry, the 1851 census has Karl Marx down as Charles Mark, doctor and philosophical author, but makes no mention of the other inhabitants of the flat, which was Marx's wife Jenny, and their maid, both of whom were pregnant by him, allegedly. When Jenny received an inheritance in 1855, though, they all moved up market and went to Primrose Hill. Um, the downstairs area is now occupied by uh, um, Quo Vardis, a restaurant, about whose founder Max Beerbohm once quipped, Oh, to be in London now that Leone's here. He was the chef, by the way, Leone's Quo Vardis. Leone is owned by a super chef, Marco Pierre White, and the pickled sheep uh, artist, <laughs> Damien Hurst. No one's yet tried to convert Marx's apartment into a communist theme park, but customers can ask to look at the rooms with their sagging ceilings and signs of wrenched off padlocks, which date back to the days when much of Soho was occupied by low-rent tenants. 
few other places to look out for. Uh, there's the Crown and Two Chairmen, a pub named after the two sedan chairs. Uh, sorry, two sedan chair men who stopped here for a drink while taking Queen Anne to the studio opposite to have her portrait painted, apparently. The Gargoyle was a major drinking club and night spot. This is on Maird Street, Maird Street. Um, not, not, not French, Maird Street. Not a French word. Uh, a major drinking club and night spot for the cream of the literary world. In the middle years of the 20th century, the Gargoyle was decorated with Matisse glass murals. Regulars included Noel Coward and apparently Dylan Thomas, who would drop into the Café Royale, uh, closed to uh, while away the early hours when the Café Royale shut. The Colony Club, um, well, that's not there anymore, but it's it's fantastic little place. Uh, it's now a restaurant, but it, is a, it was a pokey little private drinking den which opened in December 1948 and run by the foul mouths and appropriately named Muriel Belcher. Who was from Birmingham, don't you know? Oh, yes, she was. Well, she, yes, she was. She was a brummie. And I've got my eye on a show about her, but I won't tell you too much about that just yet. Um, but she somehow managed to maintain that kind of right balance between cultivated seediness and outright, outright sort of sordiness. Um, <clears throat> amused her customers to her lashing tongue. She, she used to subject customers to her lashing tongue. I won't tell you what, because it's a radio show, I won't tell you what she used to call people if she liked them, but it wasn't a very nice term. Um, she, yeah, yeah. And she sort of took note, because it was a club as well, it meant it could stay open after the pub shut. I'm talking about the um, the ridiculous licensing hours that used to be um, de rigueur in, uh, in the United Kingdom back in those days. And um, one of those people that Muriel Belcher at the Colony Rooms upset was um, Room at the Top author John Brain, who was greeted with a comment, there's plenty of room at her top when he entered. Uh, Belcher called all men her, yes. Uh, so she dominated the colony for decades. Um, and it was also the favourite haunt of uh, artist Francis Bacon, who was introduced to the place by society dandy Brian Howard. Um, the model for Anthony Blanche in Evely Moore's Brideshead Revisited, apparently, yes, whom Belcher paid £10 a week to bring in rich customers. So she'd say, is it real pain for my friends and real champagne for my... Yes, that's, I can't remember the quote now. I'd, it's on the London Literary Pub Crawl Walk if you do that. <laughs> is it champ real f- champagne for my real friends and... Oh, I don't know, but I can't remember it now. Um, I, I should know, I wrote it, but I didn't. Um, so Bacon sort of, um, yes, was... Uh, and he was one of the regulars at the Colony Rooms, other regulars in included Daniel Farson, who's Soho in the 50s, written in uh, 1987, is a definitive account of post-war life in the sort of sleazy sector. Uh, Colin McNinnis, who likes sitting there on sunny days with the curtains drawn, gossiping one's life away, as they said. Um, at the Colony, McInnes met West African seaman Olu Ogultala, whom he portrayed in City of Spades in 1957. Uh, when Belcher died in 1979, she was replaced by the even more bad-tempered Ian Board. Ida, as he was known locally, the head barman. And uh, yes, he was, uh, and then he passed away in 94 uh, and was succeeded by the slightly more reasonable Michael Wadjas. Uh, nowadays, the writers are outnumbered by musicians and artists. Damien Hurst was a regular who um, was involved with Quo Vardis, as we've already mentioned. Below the room where Karl Marx used to live. Um, but it's no longer a club. It's gone. It's now become... A restaurant. And in fact, when the club closed, one or two people, members were saying, you can't close it. We're a members club. Um, but they did uh, for financial reasons. A bit of a shame, really. But then if you want a bit of, a bit of art still, there's the Groucho Club, which is a private members club, taking its name from Grouse, Groucho Marx's adage about I'd never be a member of any club that I'd have me. Um, and that opened in May 1985. And it was kind of it's a very still a very media club. I quite like it because it was the first sort of club that um, I went to the, uh, to. I won't mention the name of the club, the Garrick. Oh, I've mentioned it uh, a few years ago. And it was quite difficult because we were with women um, and uh, I hadn't got a tie. You know, these were the sort of things. So the, when the Grout Show opened in 1985, it was really... Um, very female friendly for a start. I mean, a lot of people were involved uh, were, were were females that set the whole thing up. Um, so regulars tend to be, you know, Julie Birchall, Ben Elton, Damien Hurst again, Salmon Rushdie, bless him, used to go there, poor thing. Uh, he made his second public appearance there actually in December 1990 after going into hiding following the uh, the fatwa. Um, there's also formal events that take place, meetings of the June 20 group, which is a talk shop, and the World One Day Cup, in which writers have to pen a novel of 20,000 words in 24 hours. I love the idea of that. In October 1998, Ted Hughes, 
failed to turn up to collect his forward poetry prize for birthday letters. His poems about life with Sylvia Plath. Um, but it's a private members club, so not that easy. And to be honest, it's a little bit aircraft carrier when you... And not an aircraft carrier. It's a bit, bit air... Sort of, what am I talking about? Airport. Airport chic, I think, once you get inside. But I'm being cruel. It's a lovely place. Um, but one place definitely worth sticking your head in if we're on Dean Street, apart from the Soho Theatre, by the way, which is a new writing theatre and well worth going to. Um, and if you're a writer as well, or if you're in theatre and you're living outside London, quite often the Soho Theatre will reserve a little booth for you. If you phone them up and tell them you're coming or send them an email, then um, you'll, you'll, they'll, they're, they're very good. They're very good at that. So, um, yes, the French house is worth sticking your head in as well. It's a fairly small boozer, but um, well, it's known as a bohemian haunt. You can always tell the weekend the people that come up from <laughs> They don't really live in London, the visitors. Um, one or two used to kind of wear cravats and carried canes, dear boy. But uh, no, it's still a bit of a bohemian heart, but uh, bohemian haunt, I should say. And uh, uh, we thought if you go back through the archive of this show, you'll you'll know we've done interviews and chats and stuff uh, with people in the French house. So uh, it was started, actually. It used to be the wine house, it was called, when it opened in 1910. And then after the German who ran it was obliged to leave and the First World War broke out, it was taken over by a Belgium, a Victor Bellamont. Or, I'm not sure if it's Belgian or French. French. Victor Bellamont. And he changed the pub's name to the very English-sounding York Minster. Regulars still do, always did, and still call it the French house. In fact, the first time I was supposed to meet someone there, it was still called the York Minster. And I spent hours almost, well, a long time walking up and down looking for the French house. Mm. Um, but um, one day, apparently, a vicar walked in and announced to the surprise bar staff, I'm from the York Minster, to which the barman replied, no, you're in the York Minster. The vicar then explained that he meant he'd been sent by the dean of the minister of York, who'd received the pub's wine by mistake and was now returning it. The vicar said, we were so pleased that we looked at the address label and realised the postman saw the Dean bit, but not the street bit. So during the Second World War, the pub became an important meeting place for the French resistance. And legend has it, of course, that Charles de Gaulle himself drew up the free French call to arms after lunch upstairs in the uh, restaurant. Um, and it was also a major drinking den for Dylan Thomas and Powell's. Allegedly, a week before he went to America in October 1953... Dylan Thomas left the only copy of the original handwritten manuscript of Under Milkwood, which he wrote in 1952 in the pub. Um, I know a lot of pubs in Soho claim that it was where Dylan Thomas left the script, but I think it probably is the French house because he, he was there quite a lot. The BBC apparently put up a frantic search, but Don, Dylan Thomas had to leave for the USA with an inferior typewritten copy. Uh, it was eventually found by our BBC producer, Douglas Cleveden, uh, Cleveden, sorry, who was spurred on by Dylan Thomas's promise that if he found the original, he could keep it. So he did. He later sold it for the then pricely sum of £2,000. Hmm. And um, these days, the French house is a good little place to go to, um, but still associated with Dylan Thomas, which fits nicely into this because it was uh, 9th of November 1953, Dylan Thomas passed away in the United States of America. The legend has it, you know, was it 12 double whiskies? But actually, he was asthmatic. Uh, the air was very bad. But let's not let's not destroy the the myth. Let's hear from him though. This is Dylan Thomas, and perhaps appropriately, given that it was where he drew his last breath. This is called "Visit to America." In the mustard seed sun, by full tilt river and switchback sea, where the cormorants scud. In his house on stilts, high among beak and palavers of birds this sand grain day in the bent bay's grave he celebrates and spurns his driftwood 35th wind turned age heron spire and spear under and round him go flounders, gulls, on their cold, dying trails, doing what they are told. Curlews aloud in the congered waves work at their ways to death. And the rhymer in the long-tongued room who tolls his birthday bell toils towards the ambush of his wounds. Herons, steeple-stemmed, bless. In the thistledown fall, he sings towards anguish, 
Finches fly in the claw tracks of hawks on a seizing sky. Small fishes glide through wines and shells of drowned ship tons to pastures of otters. He in his slant racking house and the hewn coils of his trade perceives herons walk in their shroud. The livelong river's robe of minnows wreathing around their prayer. And far at sea he knows who slaves to his crouched eternal end under a serpent cloud. Dolphins dive in their turn-turtle dust. The rippled seals streak down to kill and their own tide-daubing blood slides good in the sleek mouth. In a cavernous swung wave silence wept white Angelus knells. Thirty-five bells sing struck on skull and scar where his loves lie wrecked, steered by the falling stars. And tomorrow weeps in a blind cage, terror will rage apart. The four chains break to a hammer flame and love unbolts the dark and freely he goes lost in the unknown famous light of great and fabulous dear God. Dark is a way and light is a place heaven that never was nor will be ever is always true and in that brambled void, plenty as blackberries in the woods, the dead grow for his joy. There he might wander bare with the spirits of the horseshoe bay or the stars, seashore dead, marrow of eagles, the roots of whales and wishbones of wild geese with blessed unborn God and his ghost and every soul his priest, gulled and chanter in young heaven's fold, be at cloud quaking peace, but dark is a long way. He on the earth of the night alone, with all the living praise, who knows the rocketing wind will blow the bones out of the hills, and the scythed boulders bleed, and the last raid shattered waters kick, masts and fishes to the still quick stars, faithlessly unto him who is the light of old and air-shaped heaven where souls grow wild as horses in the foam. Oh, let me midlife mourn by the shrined and druid heron's vows, the voyage to ruin I must run, dawn ships clouted aground. Yet, though I cry with tumble-down tongue, count my blessings aloud, four elements and five senses, and man a spirit in love, Tangling through this spun slime To his nimbus bell-cool kingdom come And the lost moonshine domes And the sea that hides his secret selves Deep in its black base bones Lulling of spheres in the seashell flesh And this last blessing most that the closer I move to death, one man through his sundered hulks, the louder the sun blooms, and the tusked ramshackling sea exults, and every wave of the way and gale I tackle the whole world then with more triumphant faith than ever was since the world was said spins its morning of praise i hear the bouncing hills grow locked and greener at berry brown fall 
and the dewlock sing taller, this thunder claps bring, and how moss bend with angels ride the men sold fiery islands. Oh, holier than their eyes, and my shining men no more alone. As I sail out to die. Dylan Thomas visit to America. And that's all we've got time for this week. Thank you very much for your company. If you'd like to get in touch, it's radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk. Radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk. And I, Nick Hennigan, will see you next time. You've been listening to Literary London on Resonance 104.4 FM. <laughs>